Wide receiver Jordan Addison cited for reckless driving. Do we have to panic about all this? Let's break it all down. It's the Locked On Vikings podcast. You like that on three, one, two, three. You, like it! you are Locked On Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Locked On Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I am your host, Luke Braun, and hey, let's find some joy today. You can find the Locked On Vikings podcast wherever you find your favorite shows, whether it is a podcast listening app or platform like SiriusXM, we're on their app now, YouTube, or even Amazon Fire or Roku. Just download the Locked On Minnesota Sports app. Thanks so much for those of you who do listen to the show every single day. Cannot tell you how much I appreciate you guys from the bottom of my heart. Uh, Today, I planned and am still planning to go through a whole bunch of players on the Everyman series. I think I got 15 or 16 of them prepped. Um, So I'm going to get through as many of those as I possibly can, try to play a little catch up. I've got too many players. We're too close to camp, which is fun, uh, but we kind of have to speed through the rest. However, first, we got to talk about Jordan Addison. So uh, Jordan Addison was cited late Thursday or early Thursday morning, I guess you would say 3 a.m. Um, going 140 and a 55 on uh, I-94 through St. Paul, that big stretch in a Lambo, probably just like trying to get as much speed as he can on that straightaway. Uh, cited for reckless driving, horrible speeding ticket. He, stand, he he faces losing his license for like six months. It's a really bad thing. Um, that is the whole story. He got, he got, he got a ticket. It's a really reckless thing, very dumb thing to do, uh, and in order to dissuade such a dumb thing, the state of Minnesota will cite and fine you and perhaps do other punishments depending on uh, if, if you're going to fight the ticket or whatever, but that's it. So there's a whole bunch of things I think people are freaking out about. Uh, for one, this probably does not trigger anything in the personal conduct policy, the NFL's player conduct policy. That usually will not happen when it's just reckless driving or speeding. Uh, you have to have be inebriated. You have to have something else in the car. Like you get caught with weed in the car or a gun in the car or something, have somebody else in the car and you've endangered them. Maybe there's something there or some other confounding factor to the incident. And according to the police report that is public record, there was nothing like that. He was pulled over, over for speeding. He took his ticket and that was that. There was no arrest. You might see uh, a lot of websites say Jordan Addison arrested. He was not arrested. That's probably important for player conduct policy reasons. Uh, he was, there was, there was no arrest. It was, he was cited. That means he got pulled over and he got issued a ticket and then he went home. Uh, th- whatever he has to deal with is not really something that we as fans need to care about. And I think there are two kinds of people that I want to talk to about this. The first kind is the kind that some of you guys are like, Oh, who among us has it? gone 140 on the freeway at 3 a.m. in our cars and uh, what i you guys what don't do that jordan addison if you are listening don't do that be safe that's like a very unsafe thing to do that's really dangerous and there's no reason to do it don't do that oh my god uh the second group of people are people who take it are, are going crazy the other way and i've seen I wouldn't respond to this much, except I've seen it in like other media outlets that I consider like a peer. So I need to talk to that too. Don't, it's fine. Like it's a dumb thing that he shouldn't do, but it's, it's a ticket. He didn't rob a bank. He he didn't didn't kill anybody. He could have, but he didn't. Uh, He is, it's a very reckless move, but I think people are ascribing like a morality to it that doesn't exist. Um, you don't know Jordan Addison well enough to decide if he's too stupid to be a Viking or not. And I think people are trying to take it that way. Like, Oh wow. What a bad start. The first round pick is up to like that. It has nothing to do with what he's going to do on the field. If if you want to try to reach really hard and say, well, he does it reflects poor judgment. You don't know Jordan Addison well enough to know about how good his judgment is or isn't. I don't either. Unless you're like a friend of his, you don't get to say that. So kindly, I don't know, understand what you don't know about him. Keep your mouth shut, maybe. That's all I'm going to say on that. I want to move on to uh, the Everyman series. I have a whole bunch of players here. These are players that, for one reason or another, I- I'm not going to be able to get to in a full segment like I really wish I could, um, either scheduling or some of them it's just hard to find information on. A lot of offensive linemen in this one today. 
And I'm just going to rip through as many of them as I possibly can, as fast as I possibly can. Uh, these players all have sources linked in the description, so enjoy that. And here we go. This is going to be rapid fire, so uh, buckle up. Go at 0.75 if you have to, because I'm going to rip through these. The first one goes to Abraham Beauplan, uh, the linebacker out of Marshall undrafted free agent. He never even wanted to be a football player. He was more of a soccer and a basketball kid. But when his friends wanted to play football, he picked it up too. And he eventually never put it down. But that meant he was kind of late to the sport. And he was late to the idea of going to college for sports and the process that that requires. So he goes through the whole dance of college recruiting and he gets lots of offers from lots of schools. And they're like, okay, what are your test scores? Your SAT, your ACT. And he's like, my what? <laughs> he didn't, he never took them. Uh, never had any scores. So he wasn't actually able to get into any of the schools that wanted him to play there. And he had to take a year and go the Juco route. He goes to Navarro College, I think in New Mexico. Uh, don't quote me on that, but it's a Juco college. And he had to work his way up from there. He was not there for long before he got his test scores and he got everything right. And he ends up uh, getting all of those schools back interested again. He ends up choosing Marshall, where he is uh, very steady staple for them on defense. There's a group of linebackers there that sort of lead the team throughout the next couple of years. And now he's here in Minnesota trying to be that sort of super athletic guy and finish catching up from that blip in his recruiting process. Next one is a says, is a says who was born to Nigerian parents in Indianapolis and then end up going, ended up going to the Gophers where he played every game for four years. He found a lot in common with Boye Mafe and the two of them are still really, really good friends. Talk to each other all the time. Um, when, it says he got drafted. He and Mafe kind of kept tabs on each other. And so when it says he made the team last year and got to learn even more from the likes of Harrison Phillips and Zadaria Smith and all of that stuff, it was like this really exciting brotherhood thing as these two guys go, oh my God, look at us both. We're both in the NFL. And for Otomo, it's this awesome thing as well because he gets to stay in the same city. So he says this whole thing feels like home. If you ask him now, hey, what's it like to be a Viking? He'll always say like, it feels like home. It feels like I'm in the right place. Um, and it's this great opportunity and we'll see if he can make anything more of it as he has this opportunity to compete for more and more playing time as he gets older. Uh, elsewhere on that defensive line is James Lynch. We're actually going to do all the 2020 fourth round picks, a lot of 2020 draft picks today. Um, if you ask James Lynch, he feels perpetually overlooked like this, this full on underdog. And, and maybe that's faded a bit. This is from, you know, him as a college player. Maybe it's faded a bit in the pros as he's carved out this role on the Minnesota Vikings of the National Football League. But I bet he still has something of a chip on his shoulder because when he was going out, he was a Texas football player and he didn't get any looks at all from Texas or A&M. And those are the what he calls like the blue blood schools. They never recruited him. And so he ends up going to Baylor, which, you know, also Texas. Uh, and punishing those schools the best he could gets this really close relationship with Matt Rule, who's created this ultimately awesome culture in Baylor for that. And it's what ends up getting him the NFL job with the Panthers eventually. Um, and then James Lynch joins the Vikings, where he's moves around positions and sort of slowly but surely finds his place on an NFL roster. Next up is Troy Dye, who has something of like everybody has their before after moment. If you ask, it's a great, like, deep campfire question. Uh, if you're having that kind of conversation, like, what's your before after? What's your, this is the moment where there was life before it and life after it. And for Troy Dye, that happens in April of 2020, where within the span of a month, he gets drafted by the Minnesota Vikings. He has his first child and the entire world shuts down <laughs> because it's April of 2020. Uh, absolutely insane time. There is the you know, fun, loving, get to play with my brother thing. He, Travis Dye played at Oregon as well, went to USC. Now he's an undrafted free agent somewhere, I forget. Um, those two guys are brothers, though. They are fat, great times playing together at Oregon. And uh, then this moment on the Vikings where he's sort of got to come into his own as a special teamer more than as a... Uh, an actual linebacker. He's gotten in as a linebacker because of injuries or what have you, uh, but he's sort of found, again, that role as, now I'm like the kickoffs guy, and that's like what I do, uh, and finding that place on an NFL roster. Another player who played with his brother in college, 
DJ Wanham grew up with his brother Dylan fighting wrestling. Uh, there is this great anecdote of those two guys like wrestling too hard. And one of them like flips the other one over and they end up putting this huge hole in the wall. And they'll like tell it any times like, all right, what, what do you mean? You guys like every brother's like rough house. They're like, no, we like broke the house. <laughs> That's just what they were. Um, so DJ Wanham goes to the South Carolina Gamecocks and his little brother Dylan is an offensive lineman. Of course, DJ Wanham's an edge rusher. So he's like, when his little brother is recruiting, DJ Wanham is like, I really want you to go to South Carolina, but I don't want to say it too much. I don't want to like influence your decision. You make your decision for you. But he's like really stoked that Dylan ends up choosing South Carolina. They didn't like really say we're going to do this together uh, necessarily like out loud. It just kind of worked out that way. But they did end up sparring with each other in practice every day, making each other better, better, all this great stuff. And much like the other two guys out of that 2024th round, kind of slowly carving out his role, not necessarily the most glorious role. He's not Daniil Hunter, but he's carving out that role as a spot starter, rotational player, specialist guy, depending on what all these different defenses have needed. I have a lot more guys to get to, so I'm, I'm going to try to flip through them as fast as possible. If we don't get to them all, then I'll, I'll get to them uh, another day. But I also want to make sure I talk to you a little bit about, let's, we're switching gears so hard here, fantasy football. <laughs> eBay Motors has the fantasy picks of the week. They're eBay's guaranteed fit fantasy picks of the week. Right now we're talking about the turn. Uh, the If you have like the last pick in the first round, first pick in the second round, what kind of guys... Do you, can you expect to get there that will work? And how about we go double wide receiver? These are all provided by Locked On Fantasy Football host Vinny Iyer, who has partnered with eBay Motors, CeeDee Lamb, and A.J. Brown. How about you just get a couple of guys that you know are going to be the number one options for their team on good offenses that will be reliable? I think that's what you're really looking for at the turn is that reliability. You can spark your roster with two wide receivers and have that position locked down and then maybe you can figure out how to go running back, maybe to go zero running back, but you're set up in a good place for the draft. Both Vinny Iyer and Locked On Fantasy Football know that it's all about that, fitting those pieces together and finding that right fit. And it works the same with your vehicle. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, over 122 million parts and accessories for your vehicle are right at your fin fingertips. And you can make sure that your ride stays running smoothly. Air filters, brakes, batteries, taillights, alternators, whatever it is your car will need, you can find it at eBay Motors and they'll make sure that it is the, exactly the part you need for your vehicle the first time. So no ordering all this stuff, finding out it doesn't fit or it's not the right model or whatever. eBay Motors can help you navigate that jungle. For the parts and accessories that fit your vehicle, just look for that green check. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices at ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Thank you so much for making Locked on Vikings your first listen of the day, especially for those of you who make it your first listen every single day. I appreciate you all so very, very much. Let's move on with this rapid fire every man series episode of the Locked on Vikings podcast. We're talking about a lot of offensive linemen now. I got like six O linemen in a row, so I hope you like the big boys. I certainly do. Um, and there's a couple of guys on the starting roster that are in this group today. One of them is Ezra Cleveland. And it's kind of funny, we, they, when the Vikings drafted Ezra Cleveland, there's a lot of jokes about like better than Ezra and his name and stuff. That is a weird name though, right? Like how, how did we get there? He's named after Ezra Lusk, a Supercross star. Uh, his family, big dirt biking motocross fans. And he did a little bit of dirt biking as a kid, even broke his arm once when he was five, although he put the kibosh on that when he was uh, in high school, playing high school football, ended up hurting his leg pretty bad and getting it infected in a, in a dirt bike accident. Uh, which was, that was the end of that hobby. We are now playing football <laughs> and taking it seriously. But he says that all of that pain, breaking injuries, accidents and all that, nothing compared to turf toe, which he got at Boise State. It was an interesting landing spot, Boise State, as he was a defensive tackle for most of high school. And he was a, a fast defensive tackle. He would run guys down, you know, chase down running backs and stuff. And he had this ability in the open field. Um... One of the Boise State recruiters was the OL coach who was like, wait, this kid can move and he's big. Well, I kind of want him on my side and let's see what we can do there. So he ends up making that pitch. And most of the schools that recruited Ezra, Ezra Cleveland wanted him as a D tackle. 
But I guess that pitch worked on him because he agreed to be an offensive tackle at Boise State where he's sort of like found his own. He learned offensive tackle for four years, gets to the Vikings. Now you're right guard. <laughs> you're flipping sides. You're moving inside. And it was this whole thing. Struggled a lot his rookie year, flipped over to the left side. And he's sort of found a little bit more of a rhythm there uh, as he stacks more and more years together. Uh, Austin Schlotman was a star at Brenham High School alongside Cortland Sutton, actually. So it was kind of cool that after going undrafted out of, I want to say it was TCU, that he ended up in Denver alongside Cortland Sutton again. Um, he He's one of those undrafted guys. I mean, that was 2018, I think. Yeah, he's one of those undrafted guys that has put together something of an actual career. It was an undrafted guy on a practice squad just trying to make the, uh, just, just trying to make a name and, and, cement himself inside an organization and then he ends up with the rams a little bit ends up with the vikings a little bit all playing backup roles depth roles just kind of sneaking onto rosters but when you're a guy like josh sokol who is exactly where austin schlopman was after the 2018 season hey i had one year as the third string guy on a practice squad can i make more out of this career looking at a guy like schlopman might be uh an interesting inspiration um but Sokol's a long shot as was a long shot as a rookie. Him making the practice squad was probably the most he could have hoped for coming out of Sacred Heart University in Fairfield, Connecticut. Uh, things were quite a whirlwind for him trying to get the, the playbook down and, and learn things on the fly and transition on the fly and go from Sacred Heart to the way, way, way higher level of intensity that is in the NFL. But he did just enough to show potential and say, all right, you can be on the practice squad and we'll bring you back for camp next year. And now he feels like he can get a better shot at earnestly making the team, maybe even knocking off a guy like Austin Schlopman or, or Chris Reed, somebody that, you know, we all sort of have penciled in on the roster. But all these long shot hopefuls are guys that uh, seek to upset that balance. Um one interesting thing about him, like an interesting thought kind of rattling around in his head when he first gets to the Vikings is, you know, he's the whole spent like a whole year trying to convince teams. Yeah, I went to Sacred Heart, but and trying to like overcome that small school stigma until he's in camp and he is on the same team wearing the same jersey as everybody else. And you wouldn't know he went to a small school. He's standing next to power five players, dudes from LSU. And suddenly it's, okay, all of our play does the talking and let's see how this shakes out. For him, he's managed to get just enough of a foothold to maybe try to spring up. I want to take you now to Fort Worth, Texas around the end of the 2021 season. There is a billboard outside of the TCU campus that says, Pony up for Fort Worth. It's a bit of a trash talk thing from the SMU Mustangs, who earlier that season had beat TCU 42 to 34. And on that billboard are a couple of the key SMU players, one of whom is Alan Ali, a uh, do-it-all offensive lineman. He's played all the positions, sort of this stalwart and, and, and a rock for that organization. Uh, he could be done with school at the end of 2021 and go into the draft, but he does have an extra year of eligibility thanks to COVID ruining everything for everybody. <laughs> um, and what's interesting is his head coach and his offensive line coach are headed to where else but TCU. So there is this, this billboard showing, like trying to dunk on TCU, showing a guy that will then go and join TCU. <laughs> Alan Ali will go play one more year at TCU to kind of follow those guys, try to get a little bit of a comfort. And now he's um, competing with the Josh Sokols of the world to try to get a practice squad slot or maybe even sneak onto the back of the roster and be a dark horse. Um, somebody who's already kind of been through that is Blake Brandell who we'll say around 2013, it's ninth grade for him, uh, there is a gigantic freshman walk in the halls of Central Catholic High in Portland, Oregon. And he has played some football before in youth programs, but he's sat his family down and said, nope, I'm going to be a basketball player. All right, you can play basketball. But as he's walking the, the halls of the school, there's a football coach who knew about him and said, hey, why didn't I see you at practice? And he goes, no, I'm just playing basketball. And that coach is like, no, you're not. You're a football what you're a football player. Come to football practice and ends up like talking it back, talking him back into it. And he ends up playing both sports for a couple of years. And a little bit later, a couple of years after that, after his junior year, he sits his family down. He says, Everybody, I'm a football player. 
I'm just not going to play basketball anymore. So he puts that sport away, ends up focusing more on football, goes to Oregon State. And Sonny, his, his mom thought he was more of a basketball player than a football player and thought that basketball was going to be a better avenue toward like getting a scholarship for him. Uh, and she was like, well, he proved me wrong because he ends up going to Oregon State and being their left tackle forever. And then he goes to the Vikings where he doesn't make the team the first year, but he sneaks onto the roster the second year and sort of becomes a, another guy that is slowly developed into something that the team has a use for. And now he's on that exclu exclusive rights contract thing where it's kind of a pseudo fourth year of your contract. And now I, it seems like they're cross training him at guard too, which is going to be an interesting step in his journey. Um, the last offensive lineman today is, but not least for sure is Garrett Bradbury who actually went out to night, uh, NC State as a tight end, as he was recruited as a tight end, which is something you might have known about when you're obsessed with his size. But he, honestly, he is the next in a long line of Vikings small centers from John Sullivan, who was 300 at the combine. It's pretty small for a center to Mick Tinglehoff, famously small and quick. Uh, all of those guys were of that same mold. Bradbury is just the latest, although the league has, you know, evolved in such a way and these nose tackles have gotten so much bigger. Maybe that's a bigger problem for you. But either way. As a freshman at NC State, he uh, hurt his shoulder, redshirted. He'd already gained a little bit of weight uh, just going to college, it happens. But then as he was rehabbing his shoulder, he gained even more weight. And the coaches said, instead of trying to get him saying, oh, you're, you know, not in bad shape, saying, hey, you might actually just kind of be growing into this. We're just going to move you to offensive line. It wasn't a discussion or a question. It's you're you're an O-lineman now. And that's why he ended up on uh, the offensive line for them. He played guard all the way up until his final year at NC State where they moved him to center and something really clicked with all that outside zone. He wins the Remington Award, ends up as a first round pick where in the Vikings, you know, I mean, he's gotten a lot of flack and he's had his struggles to be sure, but he has also had a steady hold uninterrupted on that job outside of injury last year, uninterrupted hold on that job, even earning that second three-year deal from a front office that's different from the one that drafted him got a few more guys to uh, get through here rapid fire i wish i could get more deep into all of these stories but you know how it goes camp's coming around the corner i'm not going to complain about that but we will keep it rolling moving on with this everyman rapid fire episode of the locked on vikings podcast next up is zach ogile the uh backup fullback from the university of Minnesota Duluth. Um, and he had actually spent a lot of time in TCO Performance Center before he even sniffed the Vikings because as a Duluth player, he took an awkward hit once in a game versus Moorhead and he got the trifecta injury, the unholy trinity. I think somebody else in in this, uh, the, this series had a doctor call it. ACL, MCL, and meniscus all torn up. And working back from that, faster than I think a lot of people expected at, at the University of Minnesota Duluth, but he was using TCO Performance Center's uh, facilities for that. Apparently they were, they, they made that available to him. So he kind of knows his way around the building a little bit. Um, he will take, and COVID messes with things too, so he will take, he's, he was in college for six years. He'll take all that extra time to get a true college resume out there. Uh, but he was a really easy invite to rookie minicamp. Hey, you know where to park, right? Like you've been here, you, you're local, bring you in and have you do the fullback thing. And they actually liked what they saw enough to bring him in as a possible backup fullback, maybe be a practice squad guy, sort of Jake Vargas style in case CJ Ham gets hurt. It's nice to have a guy like that in the building and, or at least on your Rolodex. Next up is Theo Jackson, a uh, second year safety. And he always played defensive back, racked up all kinds of stats at Overton high, which is in Tennessee, like Elm Creek or something like that, Tennessee, uh, they had him run around a lot. He was one of these athletes that was just like so much better than everybody else that you would just sort of have him do anything and he would be the most dominant player on the field no matter what position he was playing. He was mostly a DB. That was his kind of main bread and butter, but they would put him in at offense too and they would just have him run jet sweeps. They would have him do kind of wildcat quarterback stuff, have him run option plays and stuff like that. Um, Going into his final year at Overton, they actually had him play true quarterback. He was just the quarterback for the team. He's like, all right, I got to learn how to throw. But, you know, last time I, I kind of only ever ran and the defense knew what was coming. So now I'm going to be part of the passing game. And he actually goes into Tennessee saying, hey, 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 I can play a little quarterback. Can I play a little quarterback? 
Um, but he does get recruited to the Tennessee Volunteers. He grows up, he's a Volunteers fan ever since he's a kid. He's always draped in orange. So going to Tennessee as a Volunteers is a really cute thing for him. Uh, and then he gets drafted by the Tennessee Titans in the sixth th- last year. So this is a Tennessee guy through and through. This is CJ Ham, but for Tennessee. Unfortunately, though, he will not make the 2022 Tennessee Titans. He'll be on their practice squad for a few weeks until the Vikings go out and poach him. And they give you the line about how we've got a free sixth rounder because we took one of their draft picks. Kind of a reverse Marcus Epps situation is what they're trying to manifest here. And we'll see if Theo Jackson can find a way into the rotations of the secondary. Of course, a deep safety group. Uh, And he's listed as a safety. But, uh, you know, anything can happen in training camp. Uh, Another undrafted guy is Ben Sims, the first reasonable tight end for Baylor for a long time. Baylor was not really the kind of team that had a do-it-all X-Factor tight end. They call him the X-Factor. For a a very long time, somebody that could be a bigger body and actually go run a route, but also block the way he has to and all that stuff. They were uh, very excited about him there and all of the size and all of the talent that he offers. There's a very much a potential kind of guy with Ben Sims. But I actually want to move on to Invergrove Heights native Garrett Mogg, who was a superstar for the University of North Dakota for three years. He, like, was their offense. He's a big body, good at running routes, athlete, all that stuff. Um, And he was, like, earning real draft stock going into his final year at the University of North Dakota. If he could have one more good year, it felt like sky's the limit. Maybe this is one of these small school kids we pay a bunch of attention to. But week one of the 2021 season, he'll be running around and he'll come up lame. It's his hamstring. Um, totally just out, you know, one of those ran too hard kind of injuries and he'll never be hundred percent for that. He gets like 250 yards that whole year. He'll never be hundred percent. It's never going to be right. He'll come back to the field and try to gut it out. And it's just, it's just not quite right for that season. But again, thanks to the COVID eligibility and all that, he has an extra year to use. So he will use that extra year to try to get his momentum back. Um, and he does. Okay. He does about as well as he did in the, in the truncated 2020 season. Um, and sort of proves that, all right, that at least that wasn't just a small sample fluke, right? At least I'm at, I'm, I'm that good, but he didn't take that, that next step he was hoping to take. And I think he's hoping to take it in the pros. Um, he will get a rookie minicamp invite to the Vikings and he's one of the other guys that comes in and they'll actually bring him in and, uh, give him that extra look as sort of a, a big athletic body, but he's still sort of searching for that superstardom that if you were a big University of North Dakota fan headed into the 2021 season, you were going, oh, this kid is going to be our real guy. And two years removed from that, an injury and some weirdness, he's still looking for that spark. Last guy for today is Nick Mullins, who is undoubtedly the second best quarterback to come out of Southern Miss right next to Brett Favre. Uh, But he actually broke some of Favre's passing records at Southern Miss higher volume game nowadays. Um, and he is just the exact right kind of insane to play football at a high level. There's an anecdote I have to tell you about him. They are uh, getting absolutely routed. It's a 55 to 32 blowout loss when Mullins hurts his thumb and he comes back to the sideline and he shows his coaches and the coaches are horrified to see a bone sticking out. It's like one of these nasty compound fractures. And he looks at him and he's like, oh, just push it back in and wrap it up. I can go back out there. I think I can still throw absolutely insane person (laughs) that's the kind of attitude that nfl football players have to have uh and that is just unfathomable to me that kind of toughness I, i can't imagine even thinking about saying i can throw put me back out there uh but that career at southern miss gets him a shot with the san francisco 49ers and after a quiet rookie year there and in his second year that's 2018 and in 2018 you remember jimmy garoppolo blew out his knee Nick Mullins actually goes in as the backup for a couple of games. In particular, a Thursday night football game, Nick Mullins against the Oakland Raiders, and uh, he will absolutely explode. Do you guys remember this game, this Thursday night Nick Mullins explosion game? People were like really debating if he if they actually found a Tom Brady. It was really similar to the the Brock Purdy narratives we're hearing right now. Uh, you know, is this they, this late guy, this total unheralded QB? Did they find a diamond in the rough, or is this just the 49ers being a really well constructed team? Um, regardless, he'll be the 49ers backup for a good while until uh, he he gets an injury in his last season. They don't bring him back, and then he sort of does his journeyman thing for the last couple of years. He spends a little time in Cleveland. He spends a preseason in Las Vegas for the now Las Vegas Raiders, and he'll 
the the Vegas Raiders will host the Minnesota Vikings, who last year were having a bit of a problem at backup quarterback. It was Kellen Mond and Sean Mannion, and they weren't happy with either of those guys. And Nick Mullins looked pretty good on tape on the other sideline. So they said, hey, let's just trade for that guy. Backup quarterback will trade a, a seventh round pick two years from, from now and have him come in. Uh, and that's where he is now. But now he's got to stave off Jaron Hall to keep his job, uh, which maybe they keep both, right? But if Jaron Hall does get the QB2 job, there's not really a reason to keep Nick Mullins. doesn't necessarily work the other way around because Jaron Hall could just be a developmental guy. But Nick Mullins, you know who he is, right? So there is a little bit of pressure on that camp for Nick Mullins that uh, I, I find particularly interesting to watch. Okay, we got through a total of 16 players there and the story about Jordan Addison. I hope you guys feel satiated because uh, we're not going to talk till Monday. The rookies will report on Monday. Um, I'll have a 53 man roster coming up probably the week after next, because I do want to finish the Everyman series. We're now in range. We've got just a few players left uh, and I will keep you abreast of anything important though, that happens in training camp. Don't you worry about a thing. I will see you all Monday. And as always skull.